Hello, and welcome to another edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. Today's podcast is about thinking a new thought, about changing your mind, doing so publicly. And it usually happens in a couple of ways. Actually, you've thought about it for a very long time, and then you finally come to that realization or some event occurs and you go, okay, that's it. I don't think that anymore. Well, one of our cases in point in this country is Patrick Moore. You might remember this name. You'll certainly remember the Greenpeace name. He wrote this book in 2010. I think that's right. Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, the making of a sensible environmentalist. Now, to say that he is controversial would to be risking understatement of massive proportion, but we don't care. We're pleased to welcome him. Patrick, great to see you. Thanks for having me on, Pamela. It's been a long time since we crossed paths and yes. uh, pleasure to be with you. It's really, really wonderful. And I've been wanting to have this conversation with you for a very long time about how you go from radical activist to sensible environmentalist. So what's the process? Well, it, I, I didn't leave Greenpeace. It left me, uh, <laughs> is, is how I would put it, because I've been a scientific mind all my life. My my parents bought me the books of knowledge, which are about three feet wide, when I was 12. And I, I read them cover to cover. And ever since, and she, my mom introduced me to Bertrand Russell, uh, the British philosopher uh, and great thinker. And I read his books when I was in my teens as well. So by the time I got sent off to boarding school in Vancouver at age 14, yeah. um, I had already built a boat and uh, was uh, keen on doing things. And You, keen you on lived in a very remote part of, of Vancouver Island, just to be clear. Like you actually had to take a boat to go to school. Um, even in the young days. So you weren't watching a lot of television and, uh, you know, all of those things, these books, this that created your world inside your head. When the TV came to Winter Harbor in the, oh, I, I can't remember what year it was, but I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, the thing that struck me most was now all the curtains were drawn in the summer evenings. <laughs> uh, when 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 you supposedly have them open so you can see outside at the beautiful right. scene scenery of the beach, uh, and I I had no road. There was no road in my childhood. It was only the water, and yeah. went to school in a boat. And when the road came, we thought, "Wow, now this place is just going to burst." You know, people becoming. Well, most of the people use the road to get out. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I learned something about human nature there. Uh, and, and and since then, uh, we've built a house there. My wife, Eileen, and I, of 50 years plus, uh, built a home there. When I finished my PhD at UBC, we went back to the land sort of thing. Yeah. Built a house on the water and uh, never looked back. Then we still have that beautiful little cabin there where we go all the time. So you you have been an environmentalist from early days. That's how you see yourself, a respect for Mother Nature, uh, both its beauty, but also it can be vicious and cruel. If yes, a I, I, I'd call myself a realist about those sorts of things. Um, this planet is not perfect uh, in terms of the fact that you have to survive on it, and uh, there there are often bad weather events, for example. And now everybody's going on about as if this never happened before, as if it was <laughs> as if it was a halcyon uh, heaven for the four point six billion years that it's been here, <laughs> and uh, it, it it's not true. And and the goofiest thing is is that we are in one of the coldest periods in Earth history now. It's called the Pleistocene Ice Age. That's why the poles are covered in ice. There were periods of hundreds of millions of years when there was no ice on either pole and the whole world was warm. And a life survived very nicely through those periods. Um, I 
consider myself to be an expert in the history of life uh, on Earth, uh, and uh, just try me. Uh, <laughs> well, th that's what we're going to do. I am. I am going to try you. And part of the reason the timing of this conversation is so interesting. Just this morning, I had the television on, and an ad from the government of Canada said, here are four things you can do, uh, including hanging your laundry outside, uh, to combat the climate crisis. Yes. And I just paused for a moment and I thought, that is now the given. We just use the, the crisis word as if it were, you know, today is Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's go to that because everybody says the oceans not everybody many people say the oceans are boiling the ice is melting we are in an apocalyptic existential crisis on the planet and if you say anything different you are a horrible climate denier so defend mr expert on life in the uh, whole wide world <laughs> well of course combat is necessary right yeah. we might fight the climate uh, as, as if it's a war uh, against the climate, uh, that would be pretty useless because the climate isn't going away anytime soon, um, no matter what we do. And so the idea that we have the power to change the climate uh, is, is idiocy. Uh, we do not have the, the power to change the climate. We are victims of the climate if you want to put it that way but how about let's try and get along with it um instead of combating it uh let's work with it uh that would mean maybe having a house with heat in it uh for the cold days and air conditioning for the hot days I think it it we are working with it we're all eight billion of us are alive on yeah. this planet we're not dying off anytime soon as far as i can see and so therefore um we live in a benign uh climate reasonably benign yeah. benign enough for us to survive in on a, on a, any given day uh we can as a matter of fact it's really nice in the sun and it's really nice on the snow uh if you're dressed properly Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I was home in Saskatchewan for the minus fifty, right? I mean, and and you yeah, that's that's cold. You, that is cold. <laughs> that's when the snow squeaks beneath your feet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I love it as long as I'm dressed properly and don't have to stay there too long. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm looking out at the bay, bay of Comox at the ducks and the swans and the geese and the eagles came by just a minute ago. I thought it was me walking out onto the porch that freaked the ducks, but no, it was two eagles yeah. coming, coming across, taking a look to see if anybody was uh, lame or, yeah. you know, could be eaten. And uh, I just, I think it's ridiculous not to celebrate this planet instead of saying that it's sick and, 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 cruel and mean and horrible that's not true it is if you're naked in, at 50 below at 50 below for sure yeah, no doubt about that but it, first point humans are a tropical species we are not descended from penguins we are <laughs> descended from apes at the equator that's where we came from and if it wasn't for fire shelter and clothing we could not live outside the tropics because even my home in Baja, where, which we've had for over 20 years, built, built on a beautiful part of the, of, of, of the Sea of Cortez. Wow. You would die there <laughs> if you didn't have, it's yeah. still too cold in the winter there, but going down into the 40s Fahrenheit, uh, you know, it never gets, never freezes there. But humans can't live in a temperature less than 10 degrees Celsius. And that's just a fact. We, our bodies are 36 degrees uh, Celsius inside, 90 some, 90 some Fahrenheit. 90.1, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and so we're, we are a tropical species. We didn't come from the North Pole. And right now, today, as we speak, I'm not talking about last year or the year before. Yeah. Right now, today, there's not one square inch of the Arctic Ocean that doesn't 
isn't covered in ice. As a matter of fact, it spreads out over the Arctic Circle into the Bering Sea, into Hudson's Bay. The whole Hudson's Bay is frozen. There isn't a square inch of it that isn't frozen right now. And then on the other side of the world, in the Scandinavia area, the ice comes down much far below the Arctic Circle there. That's the, the situation today, not 10 years ago. It's the, the ice is not melting away. It's simply not. And you you the, said that the, the planet was warming until sort of, I think, the late 90s, but now there's been a bit of, we're, we're cooling again. Well, the, the, it's all in fits and starts. Yeah. There, there's, there's short cycles, there's long cycles, there's right. longer cycles, there's even longer cycles. The cycle that brought us into this Pleistocene Ice Age, which we arbitrarily say was begun 2.6 million years ago, which b brought on the ice on the poles in, in, in earnest. Actually, the Antarctic started freezing 30 million years ago. The Arctic didn't start freezing until about 5 million years ago. And then suddenly, by 2.6 million years ago, it was frozen all the time at the top of, of the Earth, uh, at the, the Arctic, that is, because the, north, the northern hemisphere is much warmer than the southern hemisphere, simply because the southern hemisphere is mostly ocean, which takes a lot more heat to heat up, because yeah. water absorb, you know, it takes a lot more heat to heat a, a given amount of water by a degree centigrade than it does to heat the land. Because in the land, all you have to do is heat the surface. In the ocean, which are in circulation, all, there's all these currents that are, that are going from deep to surface back down to deep. And so when the sun hits the ocean, it, takes a, it, takes, it doesn't get as warm as the land does. Yeah. And, and that's why the Antarctic froze up 30 million years ago, whereas the Arctic only froze up 2.6 million years ago. These are real numbers. Yeah. Uh, not just, you know, talking out of my hat. No, no, I know you have you have studied this. So, okay, work with me here because I, I have so many questions, but I, I've got to go back and put this in context a little bit um, because there might be a person on the planet who doesn't know that you were this radical activist with Greenpeace and you ran around on little boats and tried to stop um, uh, big ships from doing bad things and saving the whales and all of those things. When you say Greenpeace left you and you were very much an activist at that time. Um, however that went, whether they left you or you left them, what what was the reason? What was changing your mind about the approach or the rhetoric or the activity? What was the what was the moment? Well, going back to the beginning, of course, ending the threat of all out nuclear war and stopping the arms race and stopping yeah. nuclear testing seemed to me to be a reasonable thing to be doing. Right. And, uh, then, of course, we went to save the whales and that made us famous. And we did save the whales. We stopped 30,000 whales from being killed every year. And it yeah. took five years to do that. And I was on all those voyages in the Pacific mm -hmm. for months at a time, finding the Russian whalers. We had inside information from the U.S. government on where the Russian fleet was every day, and we had a shore base station that could ra radio to us where they were, so we could find them. And Why on earth would the U.S. government be helping you? Well, it was one particular okay. person in uh, the... A whistleblower kind of guy. Yeah, he was a California Democrat. Okay. Um, and... Uh, we we so we had that information then and then we took on the baby seals which did not make us too friendly in Canada. No uh, kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> two hundred and fifty thousand baby seals being slaughtered with their mothers on the ice for no good reason except for fur, and uh, that was how I described it. It wasn't a, an environmental issue in a sense. It was more an animal rights, animal cruelty issue in my estimation and it was unnecessary at this time uh and it was a horrible thing to see a mother seal right. having been bludgeoned on the head to get its baby away 
then the seal sealer i have this is on film the seal, sealer then skinned the pup and left its bleeding body laying on the ice and the mother waddled over to it and put it under its chin and cried yeah now that so it wasn't really uh, it was a whole different thing than the whales the whales was yeah. about species extinction but the baby seal thing was about humanitarianism or yeah. being kind to other I, I remember you talking about that at, at the time i mean that it, it was a different issue uh for you so did greenpeace and, just become too radical and and or or you went off in that direction like what was what what I'm, happened sorry i talked too much but uh, <laughs> The, the two things that happened were one philosophical, which was that humans are evil all, all of a sudden. So, some, somehow the peace got dropped off Greenpeace and all that was left was the green. And so humans were being characterized now as enemies of the earth, the enemies of nature, as if we were the only bad species of the seven million or so that there are. And... Uh, that didn't work with me because I know we're not e inherently evil any more than any other species is. It was too much like original sin for me because I'm not a religious person, I but I have a great deal of spirituality. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm just not part of a, a sect uh, of religion. And uh, then, so I so I was getting upset about that. I yep. go and you guys, it's too much like original sin uh, for me. And uh, and I don't believe in that. Yeah. So that was that. But I stayed for some time. And then my fellow directors, none of whom had any science education except me, they were political, uh, ecological, nice Warriors. people. <laughs> Warriors, yeah. But... Uh, they decided that we should have a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide with capital letters, ban chlorine worldwide. And because it is a very toxic substance, yeah. as yeah. are all the halogens, chlor fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and adenosine. They're all in the same periodic table place. And, and they're very harsh in many ways. But on the other hand, Table salt is sodium chloride. Yeah. And that's and it keeps us alive. <laughs> yes. Gandhi marched to the sea to make salt because the British were taxing the poor people because uh, it's necessary. It's an essential nutrient, salt yeah. is. And so I tried that on them, uh, and that didn't seem to make any difference. We should still ban chlorine worldwide. And then I, I mentioned the fact that adding chlorine to drinking water and swimming pools and spas was the biggest advance in the history of public health, stopping cholera and other waterborne communicable diseases. Right. And 85% of our pharmaceuticals are made with chlorine chemistry, and about 20% of them have chlorine in them. If you look at your flu, cold and flu medications, you'll see a little C CL on there. Yeah. And... The, the, they didn't understand toxicity. Uh, toxi the, the first rule of, 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 of toxicity is the poison is in the dose. In other words, with right. table salt, it's an right. absolutely essential nutrient until you drink a cup of it with, you know, put a cup of it in water and swallow it, you die. Yeah. So uh, there's... So this break was the, science, really. You're just saying, let's let's look at the facts here uh, before we take up a cause and, and pick whatever hill it is we're going to die on. Yes, and so I, re I resigned peacefully. Uh, yeah. Received a nice letter from my chairman, David McTaggart, another Canadian, yeah. uh, who's sadly gone. But uh, he had no science either. And yeah. He thought all all the women were going to get cancer from the chemicals, and uh, and so the, I I couldn't. So that's why I say Greenpeace left me. Yeah, left you. There was another point that I read in the book that you went to a conference. I think it was in 1972, and 
I, I want to come back because one of the issues I know we shared was fighting M. Chitka and all of this. We'll we'll get into some of that. But you went to this conference and heard this phrase, sustainable development, and that kind of captured your imagination that, that there are 8 billion of us and we're going to impact the planet, but short of, you know, killing the entire species, uh, we've got to work it out. That was the first United Nations Conference on the Environment in Stockholm. Uh, it just happened to coincide, coincide with our uh, little group going over there to Europe. To We started with uh, an audience with the Pope. Oh, yeah. Wow. And, and as I said, I'm, I'm not a religious person, but right. the Pope has some pull. And, uh, <laughs> and we went there and the Pope mentioned Greenpeace's name in the audience uh, that we were there to stop uh, the war and yeah. the nuclear uh, bombs. So that was pretty cool. And then yeah. we went to, to, to France, to Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, where we occupied the cathedral as people were coming, coming through by the hundreds. There's a, a steady stream of people yeah. going through there. And we told them about how we were going to take a little boat to Mururoa Atoll in French Polynesia. At this point, the the French public had no knowledge of the nuclear tests that France was doing in 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 in, in Mururoa Atoll in French Polynesia. And so we were. We, and then we sat down in the pews, and the Surete police came, and we said, "We're yeah. staying here for the night because this is a church, and we are taking refuge." And they said, sorry, this is not actually a church. It's a national monument <laughs> and it's owned by the government. And if you try to stay here, we're going to take you to jail. Yeah. And so we left peaceably. But it, it made the news in Le Monde uh, the next morning was the first time the French people had been told by a, a journal, a uh, public journal, that these tests were going on. And it, it so it made a big deal. Then we went to Stockholm, where this conference was occurring. And instead yeah. of going to the alternative conference, where everybody was with rainbows and and uh, dancing around on the grass, uh, <laughs> we went to the actual conference, where right. all the... And we had been to New York previously, about six months earlier, and went to all the embassies of the uh, United Nations uh, embassies. I don't, I'm not sure what they're called, but either, you know they were the United yeah. Nations building is. We yeah. went in there and talked to all the countries on the Pacific about the Muro Atoll nuclear tests and briefed them on that. At this time, the superpowers, as they were called then, the nuclear weapon states, were all saying that nuclear is not an environmental issue, nuclear bombs. They're not an environmental issue. That's an issue of war and peace. And we're not going to talk about that at the Stockholm Conference on the Environment. So that's how they were yeah. trying to avoid anybody knowing about this. And but so we went there and we went to the real conference and where, where we had met lots of the people who were there uh, in the different Pacific countries. And France, uh, sorry, New Zealand who had been the leader against atomic testing in the Pacific, New Zealand put a motion on the floor against what they were told to do to ban nuclear testing in the Pacific. Yeah. And that passed by a wide, a huge majority. Only the nuclear weapon states, which were only five or whatever, uh, were against it. And that passed. And that started the ball rolling on getting France yeah. to its atmospheric nuclear testing in the South Pacific, which they did in 1974. Yeah. Okay. So two things there, because the sustainable development thing, this seems to be where we're, we're kind of hitting this crux now. You see it in Canada of Alberta pushing back against Ottawa's um, stance on the environment that that this is human caused and we're bad and somehow we have to revert to earlier times to not abuse the planet and somehow not think about all those poor nations out there where people have never had heat or cooling and we're going to deny them that anyway. But that's a whole other thing. So sustainable development and the nuclear issue, two big points. 
um, because most people who were environmentalists were opposed to nuclear energy for a long time, really until recently. Where, where, where was your change point on that for you? I realized that nuclear energy should not be lumped in with nuclear weapons. It should right. be lumped Two in different with, things. Yeah, should be lumped in with nuclear medicine, a beneficial use of nuclear technology and science. It was very. It was clear to me long before I came out publicly because I knew that if I came out publicly in favor of nuclear energy, I would be banished forever. Right. And that's what they did. They actually took my name off the founders of Greenpeace on the Greenpeace web international website, which this is thirty years after I left. Yeah. Uh, that, that I went to work for the U.S. Nuclear Energy Institute, uh, which has just under a hundred nuclear reactors on its uh, roster in the US and then there's another bunch in Canada which makes more than 100 nuclear reactors in North America where not one person has been seriously injured by nuclear radiation in those reactors in all the time they have been running and that you can't say that about coal mines. Yeah. And you can't say that about fossil fuels in general because they are when they get on fire they can cause some damage. Yeah. And that doesn't mean I'm against fossil fuels fundamentally in in any way they they are they're made from air and water's co2 but Let, let's, let's but divert on that for a moment because you've got a really interesting position on fossil fuels as i understand it which is we've got 300 million years of this stuff that we're consuming at such a rate we're going to use it up in two centuries there'll be nothing left for for other generations and also the economic argument that this fuels not just our cars but our economy like that's that does you know that's not the traditional environmentalist view of fossil fuels no actually if we just stopped using fossil fuels today half of us would die quite soon and uh and same thing with fertilizer now they're trying to ban right. fertilizer you know, the, the the use of of nitrogen uh, to make fertilizer to make ammonia won two Nobel prizes. One Haber, it's called the Haber Bosch process. Mm -hmm. Haber was a laboratory scientist, and he he figured out you have to use like hundreds of pounds of pressure and huge heat. It it takes many stages to turn the nitrogen in the air, which is a as an atomic nit nitrogen to turn it into ammonia takes huge pressure and heat and many stages and so Haber won the Nobel Prize for the process yeah. and Bosch won the Nobel Prize for gearing it up to an industrial scale where you have a huge factory which is producing uh, ammonia, ammonia, nitrogen fertilizer yeah. and this has doubled the, and more than doubled the productivity of land food production trying food. to feed yeah and 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 this whole thing uh about nitrogen it, it's it's is as bad as climate change oh. i mean that they would want to stop fertilizer it, the, the fact of the matter is carbon dioxide is lower now than it has been for in almost the entire history of the earth and it is colder now it's called the pleistocene ice age for a reason yeah. It is colder now than it has been through almost the entire history of the Earth. There's only been three ice ages in the last 500 million years. The Silurian was a fairly short-lived one, i.e. maybe 10 million years. Uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the Karoo, which began 350 million years ago, lasted till 250 million years ago. In other words, a 100 million year ice age. Then it came into the modern warm period uh, the, 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 that started approximately 250 million years ago and went up to the Eocene thermal maximum 15 years after the dinosaur extinction, which was caused by an asteroid hitting Yucatan. Uh, so that had nothing to do with climate change. It was an asteroid. Uh, but the temperature kept going up till the Eocene thermal maximum, E-O-C-E-N-E, -E -E, Eocene thermal maximum 50 million years ago 
Since then, it has cooled steadily, a bit of a pause here and there, but steadily, steadily, steadily into the Pleistocene Ice Age, which is still getting cooler. The, the Earth is still getting cooler if you look at the large picture of it. But why do we have this conversation every single day of our lives now in every form of public media, every movie star in the world is on this? We are getting warmer. We're killing the oceans. We're hurting our land. The trees are no longer breathing. They're coughing um, because of all of this. I, I just read that the other day. I mean, we do seem to be coming to a point here where there's a challenge on both sides to these kinds of uh, dramatic, as I say, apocalyptic kind of statements, which is, you know, what we're, what seems to be accepted um, discussion, but now there's starting to be a little bit of a challenge to it. I mean, when you say this stuff, uh, don't people's heads explode? <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. please don't get me talking again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. The, 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 the truth is, <laughs> CO2 was at its lowest point in the history of the Earth only 10,000 years ago at the most recent glacial maximum, which a lot of people call the last ice age. But there have been 40 glacial maximums in this place to see an ice age. And <laughs> we need a little context here is what you're saying. We are in an interglacial period now of which there have been at least 40. The, the earlier ones are a bit f fuzzy. So, but starting 2.6 million years ago, the earth went into 40,000 year cycles of cooling and warming. And then suddenly about 1 million years ago, it went into 100,000 year cycles. This is called the Pleistocene conundrum. Because <laughs> well, we don't a... know why, but we do know why. We, we, know, we, don't know, we know what, we don't know why. We know that the 40,000 year cycle is, 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 is due to the gravitational effect of Jupiter. And so is the 100,000 year cycle. This is called the Milankovitch cycles. Milankovitch uh, figured this out like 100, okay. 100 okay. years ago. He figured that out. And you are going into complete like bio geekdom here. Okay. Yep. So it's required. I understand, but it's hard, and I, of course, and nobody could, could just challenge all of that. We we don't know. Let, let me just say, the yeah. Earth is is still cooling into the Pleistocene Ice Age, and they say that the the International Committee on Stratigraphy or Stratigraphy, there's a thing called that. Oh, uh, okay. At the UN <laughs> sort of level, uh, they have said the Pleistocene is ended. Uh, the Ice Age is over. Um, still quite a bit of ice up there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's well, just this is a complete the thing. lie. It's a complete lie at an international, sorry, UN level. They are saying the Pleistocene Ice Age is over. And this Holocene interglacial period that we are in now has wiped out the ice age whereas okay. this interglacial period is no different than the 40 other interglacial other ones let, let me put it to you this way there are literally hundreds of billions of dollars being spent by yes. governments around the world and trillions or trillions you're quite right you're quite right uh to deal with these issues to fight climate change to uh, find replacements for fossil fuels. This is a pretty massive conspiracy if you say they don't really know what they're talking about. It's true, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we would be better off to fight the devil. Um, <laughs> or uh, let's let's see what other awful thing <laughs> we could go against. There is no evidence whatsoever that carbon dioxide is the control knob of the earth's climate this is what they are contending 
They're saying that CO2, CO2 is lower, lower now than it has been throughout almost the entire history of the earth. It okay, was, how can that be when we have all of the modern industry and everything that's going on? We're just little pinpricks in this, although we are doing an amazing job of replenishing the CO2 back to the air and water where it came from in the first place. And how point are we doing that? Point number one, all the CO2 we are emitting from burning fossil fuels came from the atmosphere and the oceans in the first place. It was there. Life used it and stored it as fossil fuels. Right. All the fossil fuels were made by life. They're made by life and they're full of carbon. And that carbon is now being put back into the atmosphere by our burning of those fossil fuels. It's where it came from. That's why CO2 is so low now compared to historical levels. It was 6,000. It was 4,000. It was 2,000. It was 1,000. It was 500. And it went to 180 during the most recent glacial maximum because the atmosphere and the oceans, the oceans in particular, hold more uh, CO2, more gases, when they're colder. And so as the Earth cools, it pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere into the water. But when we you, are... You we take are, a glass of water out of the fridge, yeah. put it on a table, little bubbles in... As it warms, little bubbles form on the inside of the glass. You put it back in the fridge, the bubbles go away. So th this is one way of just demonstrating that the colder the water is, the more gas it can it can hold. But and even so the oceans industry... have been breathing CO two back and forth all through the history of life, and but it has just gone consider consistently lower to the point of the most recent glacial maximum, which was twenty thousand years ago. CO2 went to 180 parts per million, only 30 parts per million above the death of plants. So all through the history of life, CO2 has been taken out of the atmosphere in the oceans and put into fossil fuels and right. into rocks. This, is, this, this one's really <laughs> a bit crazy for people to understand. But all the limestone, chalk, and marble is made from the shells of mostly marine species of life that figured out about half a billion years ago how to make armor plating for themselves out of calcium and carbon dioxide in the water. So the shells of clams and oysters and barnacles and mussels and shrimp and everything else that has a shell is made from carbon dioxide. And it all ends up on the bottom of the ocean, in, in the oceanic side. In the earth side, the trees uh, turned into coal when they died. The, the, that's another big story. It's in my paper, The Positive Impact of e e Human CO2 Emissions on the Survival of Life on Earth. We are life salvation. Another ice age at bay. <laughs> we are life salvation. We are replenishing the CO2 back into the liquid and gaseous spheres, the, the atmosphere and the oceans, where it had been locked in rocks and fossil fuels for billions of years. Okay, so I, 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 I am millions, taking you at your word because you know this stuff, so I, I can't. But what I'm saying is today we've got all of, and, and many environmentalists and many corporate leaders and many politicians saying, look, we're making a bit of a mess of things here. When you fly in an airplane into a city, you can see the smog level sitting there. The fossil fuel industry is saying, yes, we know we, we're going to clean up our act and do what we do and do it in a in a cleaner way. That's, That's why I don't work for them. They, <laughs> they, they pander into this thing themselves. The fossil fuel industry feels that they have to be guilty somehow. Yeah. You know, and it just makes me sick. I will not work for them. Uh, I, I, I still say fossil fuels are necessary, but yeah. my position is three quarters of the fossil fuels could be replaced with nuclear energy within 50 years. So this is your pragmatic answer, which is we need to do nuclear power, nuclear energy for a whole lot of reasons, because it is cleaner. 
It doesn't have those emissions. So that concern is there. I mean, we care about it being cleaner because we need things to be cleaner. Well, for me, it's not about clean because we we grew up in caves with wood smoke for (laughs) millions of years. I Uh, still do in my house in Saskatchewan. I've got an old stove. That's why I think that's why people can smoke two packs of cigarettes a day (laughs) for 40 years and still be alive. And and, uh, so that's another story, though. Yeah. Uh, the 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 truth is that nuclear energy is virtually if we we might as well think it's in infinitely an infinite amount of energy it, there there's no way that it is going to run out anytime soon whereas fossil fuels are a, a, a relatively compared to nuclear fuel relatively uh small yeah in, and and they will renewable in the short term well, they're they're certainly non-renewable, but yeah. um, you know the the word renewable is also kind of weird. But uh, <laughs> like, am I renewable? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Are the you the children? If you have the children, kind of carried on, but you yes, yourself, it, we're not it, sure. it does have a certain foundation yeah. in truth. Yeah. But uh, the 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 fact of the matter is is re- is nuclear energy is the, about the safest form of energy we've ever in- invented. It's safer than bonfires. Um, it, it's it's safer than all the fossil fuels, for but sure. There is the waste issue. There, no, there isn't the waste issue. The waste is fuel. It's just that the Russians are, have already built three fast-breeding reactors. And the, the BN, uh, look up BN-800. And B capital B capital N big nuclear yeah. looks like it stands for, but it's Russian, so I don't understand why they called it BN. <laughs> but uh, big nuclear th- these are breeder reactors, and uh, it would take me another hour to explain okay. this. But the truth is, is that all that so-called waste is is potential fuel. You don't we know need to bury it. it in northern Canada, so that we don't know what the impact will be. We are, of what? Of nuclear waste. It's not waste. It's fuel. Yeah, no, no, I understand, but that's what yeah. it. I, 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 but that's yes. what, they, what they, the argument they go is. On about nuclear waste, which is all completely contained inside concrete with steel inside. <laughs> I mean, if the worst thing that could happen is it could fall over into a river, then you'd have to get a big crane to take it back out and put it back where it was on its concrete pad. Yeah. Um, there, there, there is no threat from nuclear waste. Not only that, the so-called nuclear waste is fuel for the future. I, I could tell you about the difference between uranium two thirty five and uranium two thirty eight, if you'd like. But no, uh, not today. <laughs> only only point seven percent of natural uranium yeah. is missile can be used as a nuclear fuel directly. That's okay. called uranium two thirty five. Uranium-238 is 99.3% of all the uranium. It is fertile, but not fissile. Those are two important words. Fertile means can be made into a fissile, in other words, fuel inside a reactor, but it has to be in a reactor to be made into that. And the Russians have built three of these on the Caspian Sea, and they are working as commercial electricity producers big nuclear plants they 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 are uh running today three of them so again this becomes we can a do point this too. of controversy which is we don't want to do business with russia you know because they're uh the bad guys today we can't fix what china is doing spewing all this stuff into the air and so they're the bad guys on a on a different level um so that also the like the geopolitical overlay has to be uh overlaid so that so that these options become more or less realistic we don't need to rely on russia to build breeder reactors uh they they're also called fast neutron reactors yeah. We we they, they are well known to anyone in the nuclear industry. The, so 
then and they are just as safe as the conventional reactors which are just burning the tiny amount of uranium that's called uranium 235 uh uranium 238 can be turned into plutonium in a reactor and plutonium 239 is a fissile isotope and so all the 99 point two or three, whatever it is, uh, 99 plus percent of the uranium that is not fissile but is fertile can be turned into nuclear fuel. Now, then there's thorium. Now, they talk of thorium reactors. There's no such thing. Thorium is not a fissile isotope. It has to be first turned into uranium-233 in a reactor. Come on. And there you go. See, this is why nobody has a clue in their head hardly about what this really is but this really is i'm telling the truth that all of the thorium which is more, far more abundant than uranium in the earth's crust all of the thorium can be turned into uranium 233 and burnt as a fuel in a nuclear reactor so we have enough nuclear fuel to last what might as well be forever i mean who knows What's going to happen? Beyond our lifetimes. Yeah, like not just beyond our lifetime, yeah. beyond whatever yeah. time. It's, 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 we don't know if the Pleistocene Ice Age is going to end yeah. anytime soon. It's still getting colder and, and on a long-term basis. We're in an interglacial period, which is a slight warming of the Earth, which happens on periodic tables now of 100,000 years at a time at a time overall it's and, getting and, cooler and overall it is getting cooler and the graphs are there to see based on ocean sediments and isotopes that can pre tell you what the temperature was way back okay Over. i know you you try not to be a political activist um so just i mean you share a common past with a minister like stephen gilbo who also came out of Greenpeace and all of that. When you watch what's going on in our own country here, uh, what do you see um, in terms of the government's reaction? He voices it, Wilkinson um, voices about the concerns about nuclear. Um, is that a leftover and, from their early days or how do what, you- And what are those concerns? Are they pointing to some horrific accident that occurred lately? No, there's never been one. In the whole of North America, there's more than 100 nuclear plants going back 50 years plus, mm -hmm. and there has not been any harm caused by them. It's all fake. And you, 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 I don't know if you know my most recent book. Yeah, I was just going to go there. It's called Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. Yes, uh, I, that's I have, pretty clear. <laughs> I have discovered the universal theory of scare stories. In in, <laughs> in in physics, there's the there's an idea that there will be a universal theory of 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 of, of existence. Uh, yeah. It's sort of like E equals M C squared on steroids. This idea that there could be such a formula. I don't believe it will happen, but uh, that's just me. Uh, but what I do believe is the universal theory of scare stories, which is they are all based on things that are either invisible, like CO2, radiation, and whatever bad thing is in GMOs, which hasn't got a name. Everything has a name, yeah. right? And there's, so they, they don't even have a name for the bad thing in GMOs because it doesn't exist, whereas radiation and CO2 are real things. It's just that they're invisible. So you can make up any story you want to about them. But then there's also the remote things, which are invisible to the person. Coral reefs and polar bears are there for a reason, because no one can see what's happening. You can't, it, there's I, very- I just read a report on, uh, what, but it, again, you get 180s on this, but the, the reefs um, off and around Australia are in good shape. Yes, 38 years that uh, they have been doing a, a thorough monitoring of the area of coral, which is huge. I mean, it's half the size of Australia, practically. Yeah. And, and, and they have now concluded that 
last summer, they they said that the, there's more coral now than there has been in all the 38 years. And just a few years ago, they were saying 93% uh, of the coral reef is dying. They said it was dying. They said it was terminal. They even said it was in its final terminal stage, as if there are other terminal stages before the final one. <laughs> but all of those do not say dead. You see, dying, right? Bleached. Ble and, and bleach conjures up chlorine bleach. Again. Whereas the, 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 the term bleach as applied to coral has nothing to do with chlorine or bleach. It has to do with the fact that it turns white because it loses its plankton. Because the coral animal, the polyp as it's called, is like a jellyfish. It's it's trans, it's see through. Translucent. Has, it has no, yeah, translucent. So the the and the coral itself, the, the 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 hard coral is calcium carbonate, which is chalk, uh, and 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 which is white. Yeah. As, as okay. A, so. This theory, this theory of yours, the and, and it's kind of interesting, which is you can scare people if they can't really touch it, if they can't really see it. So sitting here in Saskatchewan or Ottawa, I don't actually know how many polar bears there are. Uh, I don't actually know whether the Great Barrier Reef is growing or shrinking or dying or bleaching or whatever it is. So that your theory is it's easy to use that. But my question is, to what end? Why do they why do they want to spend, I mean, other than, you know, people, some people get rich, but why do they want to have this conspiracy theory about the world is ending and we're a rogue species that's killing the world and it's going to be mm -hmm. us and it's going to be uh, like, what's the point of that? As it always has been, uh, fear is the biggest motivator if you're afraid you flee uh the, but the thing about the invisibleness yeah is that observation is the beginning of scientific discovery right absolutely fair replication is when you do it over and over again and get the same result and start to think, wow, this must be some kind of law. Yeah. Then there is observation, replication, and then you send it out into the world and ask other people to see if they can see the same thing. Yeah. Yep. That's got a name too. I forget what it is. But anyways, it's the... But, but peer-reviewed research, right? Yes. Maybe. Yeah. And, and and what we have now is politicians get, get, getting their uh, staff to send money to scientists in universities to get the answer they want back. That's what it's all about. And if you're in a university, the reason why my CO2 coalition, which of which I'm one of 10 directors in yeah. Arlington, Virginia, the reason why we're all a bit long in the tooth <laughs> is because if you have a job, you cannot take these positions. If you have a job in the university, it's like what, you know, you saw the Harvard president there. Yeah. That's what's going on. And or if you don't who lost their jobs over things like the uh, the vaccines and the all of yes, that kind of thing. Big, like and that, that really brought it out in the open. But yeah. it's true in all of science. And and in all institutions, that if you are an employee, you cannot have certain positions. You can't say certain things. And one of them is you can't say that you don't believe in human-caused climate change that will be bad. Uh, it, it will if you if you say that climate change is good, uh, which obviously it must be, because the climate has been changing since the beginning of time, and we are here. Yeah, as I say, and as I say, we are not descended from penguins. We are right. descended from apes. So in, this kind of quiet cons consensus that 
is what we're seeing now. I mean, this is a phase in life. It's not, it wasn't this way when I was a young girl and I don't know what it'll be when I'm an old, old lady, but uh, where we will come to on this issue. But right now the, the consensus in universities sort of encouraged by government funding and funding of research through universities has brought us to this place. And I guess what I hear you saying is that using fear um, is I, allows people to consolidate power and of course governments like power. But you were actually writing about this and I, I took a note of the time because uh, it was, you know, the book is from 2010, but you were writing about this before. Misinformation and disinformation at this point, one is kind of a mistake and one is deliberate. Like this is now all the buzzwords we're hearing right now about the internet. But you were talking about this in terms of this issue in the context of the environment that you could see it way back when. Well, my my recent book, Fake Invisible Catastrophe, yeah. is only two years old or yeah. old. Little more, but I read it in the in the Confessions book. You were talking about yes, the, in the Confessions book. Well, the, the nice thing about it is the first half of it is a historical account of yep. Greenpeace from beginning to when I left. Yeah, and that was fifteen years, and on all the things we did in those times, and also, uh, uh, but I also, of course, cover the issues in the last half of the book, but. They're covered better in my most recent book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes, okay. on Amazon in a Kindle, a soft cover, a hard cover, and <laughs> audio book. So it's all it's in all four uh accessible. Yes, it's very and it's it's not difficult to read. I I've been a scientist who does does not try to impress other people with by using words they don't know what they mean. Yeah. And, <laughs> There's a lot of that going on. But you you know, you've got, and still, I I think this is relatively recent, you've been, you've been canceled from speaking at conferences and whatnot in the last five or six years um, because of your views, because you say the climate crisis is not one. <laughs> um, it's, you know, there are lots of um, issues that we have to deal with, but that doesn't mean we're in a crisis. It just means this is life. And for that, um, and lots of researchers who've said you've misused their their work and their results. Uh, and and I don't know whether that means they're worried or or whether you did. Like what's how do you I do I, actually I don't know what you're talking about there. I well there I, was one conference, I think it was in Regina. Maybe there was another one too where they just said some anyway, it it's it's yes, a, well they will say things. <laughs> Yeah. But I don't, uh, I actually have a critique about these things uh, because I know they're not true. Certain things are that are being said are not true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I stick to the truth as I know it. And if anybody wants to question me on uh, how do you know it, I'm happy to explain. Right. Uh, I, I am, I believe absolutely pure science that's why you say i don't talk politics yeah I, I i have all kinds of political opinions but i do not share them in public uh, right. because i i think that the, the political opinions are simply mm. opinion uh whereas because there's left and right and center and all of that right. and and it's a dirty it's a dirty business uh, mm -hmm. politics. And the, the truth is, is that if politics is not based on science, then it's not true. The science, facts and truth are the basis of what we know. Politics, if it goes against what we know, is not uh, valid. And there's so much that's going against what we know right now, because we do know a lot about the history of the Earth. And we do know that this is one of the coldest periods in the history of the Earth that we are in now, every day, every year. This, yeah. is, this is the Pleistocene Ice Age. And so, so I start there, and then I say, okay, you're saying it's too hot. 
uh, for life, and it's getting too hot for life. That is a lie. It is not getting too hot for life. If it wasn't for food, shelter, sorry, if it wasn't for fire, shelter, and clothing, we could not have come out of the tropics human beings. Yeah, that no, no, we needed all those things. And and that's, I guess that's where I fundamentally respond to all of this stuff was, is for better or worse, humans inhabit the earth. <laughs> we're, we're here. We, <laughs> that's a true fact. Yeah. We need to, uh, <laughs> we need to eat. We need to travel. We need to move ourselves. We need to clothe ourselves. We need to, um, you, you know, just in order to to live, we need to have medicine, all of these things that we've got to find some way to accommodate this that is somewhere between uh, a complete and total climate denier and somebody who says, you know, the Al Gore's of the world that we must be carbon neutral by tomorrow morning or it's all over, right? Like We are not killing the earth. I would say that categorically. Yeah. We are not killing the earth. Uh, we are part of it, and yeah. uh, we, we are eating some of it, <laughs> and planting some of it, and burning some of it, and all the things we're doing, but it is not dying. It, it, it's not even close. It's not even, as a matter of fact, many of the things we do enhance the earth, especially putting CO2 back into the air where it came from in the first place. Uh, that is a fact. There's no other place that CO2 came from than the Earth. Than the Earth. It didn't come from outer space. It so, came, came from the Earth, and it is an absolutely the most essential, along with water and oxygen. Yeah, for life. Right? For life. It, it, it is, it is the, if, it, if there wasn't any CO2, there wouldn't be any life. So given everything that you have been a part of in your quite varied sets of careers here, um, activist and environmentalist and author and advisor. A little chameleon. Yeah. <laughs> All of these things. Y- you still seem to me today to be an optimist about this, even though you think a lot of the things that are going on are crazy. I will be an optimist till the day I die. Because if you're not an optimist and you and you, it's like you, you you're going. I wish I wasn't me, or something. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's ridiculous. Uh, we must f- celebrate the beauty and the uh, in, 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 amazing. There's 7.8 million species on the Earth. Yeah, and they all are living and p- reproducing successfully, and some go extinct. And we were responsible for the odd bit of that, but now we're, we're trying really hard not to do that anymore because yeah. we recognize that it's almost like a religion, um, which, I, as, as I say, I deny. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I think life is worth being religious about, uh, just our existence. Um, it is a miracle. Yeah. So there are miracles. There's 7.8 million species. Of which which we are only one. Yes, we are only one, but we are the most interesting one. (laughs) Uh, You know, there's two things we will never know for sure. How life started on this planet, it's it's absolutely beyond the ken of the human brain, I believe, to know how that happened. And secondly, whether or not we are the only planet in the universe with life on it. Uh, We don't know of any other, we haven't heard any signals, we're sending signals into the into the blackness of space um, and we're not getting any replies. And this is a young planet, this is a young star, Uh, so many of the stars have been there way way longer, like billions of years longer than ours has, and still no answer. So, uh, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would put a bet that there, that we are the only life in the universe. And a lot of people go, you're crazy. Of course, there has to be. There's so many stars. You know, it, that's the argument. 
that it, it, there must be an infinite number of places with life on them, given the infinite number of stars. But I don't buy that. I would bet that that this is the only place in the world, in the universe, where there's life. And, and how big is the universe? We do, don't even know that. Does it and we're, end? We're sort of figuring it out. We're sort it, of yeah. Does it end somewhere? Through. Does yeah. the universe end somewhere? Yeah. Or does it go on for infinity, which is a concept that what how how big is infinity? Yeah. And so those are the questions from a science point of view that I think are most interesting. And so I've been entertained by Your this, whole <laughs> this yeah, my whole life I've been entertained by the reality of the situation we are in. And I have all kinds of negative political. Uh, things to say, um, but why bother? Well, um, it, it, that's the problem with doing that. Is then it puts you in another sphere, and and you you know you seem at peace um, where you are in your little beautiful bit of Canada there and Comox, and I'm and so you, lucky. and you speak your own truth, and you have been consistent. I should hope so, as science. Uh, that is, is 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 the principle of science is is to be consistent. Yeah. It, not to say things that you don't know. Uh, not to say things that you know aren't true. Uh, yeah. Etc. Uh, to stick to your guns. So it takes us back full circle, which is what intrigued me about this in the beginning, which is why and how and for what reasons people change their mind, but. You might have changed your position, adapted your position on a few things, but you haven't fundamentally changed your mind. That is correct. Greenpeace left me. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm sorry it did. Be, and, you know, somebody, I, I, I mentioned yesterday uh, in a discussion with, a, with my yeah. board of directors that, uh, just trying to get it straight here. I, uh, where was I there about? Well, we're just talking about changing minds and that, that yes. while, while you might think differently about this issue or that issue and, and, you know, whether what we're doing with fossil fuels or this or that, but, but your view has always been kind of an optimistic one and that it's, that, that science is about consistency. That's, I think what you were. Well, this, this was a discussion, uh, about uh, a person who who had come into difficulty in his relations with other members of the group. Yeah. And I I said, uh, you know, you should think about this carefully because I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, when when I left Greenpeace, uh, no. It was when we created Greenpeace International, okay. 1979. The San Francisco group, I was the chairman of the founding group, Greenpeace yeah. Foundation in Canada, in, in Vancouver. I, I, I don't expect you to use this particularly, but no, no, it's all it's all live. I'm just saying, like, let's go, let let's let's go to our point here, because we are almost out of time. So the point is this. Yeah. Um, I was the president of Greenpeace Foundation, the founding organization. Our yeah. San Francisco group, which was now much bigger than us in fundraising capacity because it's the United States, yeah. uh, decided to break away. Said, bugger, bugger off, you guys. You're, yeah. We're going to go on our own. Um, so I ended up as chairman of the foundation to file a lawsuit for breach of, breach of copyright and trademark in San Francisco. Yeah. And the the night, the eve of when it was to go to, to court, I got David McTaggart, who was the now the leader of all the other offices of Greenpeace against the founding office of Greenpeace, because it would just have turned into uh, the word Greenpeace would no longer be valid. Uh, right. And and so I had a de debate with David McTaggart in, 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 with a lawyer, our good friend, Davey Gibbons, and I agreed to step down as chairman of Greenpeace in order because I was universally hated for being the one who was trying to make everybody else, you know, come to my feet. 
right? And I, I knew that, that I had to do that. I became one of the directors, David McTaggart, who was the leader of the bat of the of the opposition. Yeah, uh, became the chairman, and so uh, it, this was in a board of directors meeting I just had yesterday, where I tried to explain to an individual that they were in this same position now. You, you, you it's it's all about personalities and yeah. And pick your moment. And if yeah. if you're if you're not the one that can lead, then step aside and let someone else do it, whether the reasons are right or wrong. You're that's exactly what I was attempting to explain. <laughs> Patrick, I have so enjoyed this. Thank you so much for for giving us your time and wandering through this crazy landscape <laughs> debate over where we're headed but uh, I'm I'm glad to see that you don't you don't think well we're all horrible people and that we should despise ourselves for what we're doing well you you also look like you're happy in your skin so uh, <laughs> it's very nice to see you again yeah just having these conversations I think is important we gotta I think you and I share that like let's just let's just keep talking and we'll get ourselves through all of this. I would be uh, very pleased to come on yeah. with you again because I really think your line of reasoning and questioning brings out uh, the best in me. Yeah, try to be fair always, and yeah. and uh, and I just anyway, Patrick Moore. Here's this book. Okay, this is from way back when Confessions of a Green Priest Dropout. Yep. Let but me show you my other get one. the other one, fake invisible catastrophes and threats of doom. That's quite a cover. That's quite a cover. <laughs> you know where you know where you will perish in flames comes from. <laughs> no, uh, the 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 um, <laughs> it comes from the movie uh, where uh, you will perish in flames. I don't know. Ghostbusters. I Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Oh. Ghostbusters. When when the little, little Moranis yeah. comes yeah. up to the horse in Central Park and and says, "You will perish in flames." <laughs> All right, that's our next conversation. Patrick, take good care of yourself. Enjoy life there in Comox. We'll talk soon. And that is it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. I'll see you soon too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>